A special thanks to uh, Mentor Graphics uh, Foundation, which is separate from the corporation. We asked them a number of years ago. We said, hey, a lot more students would come if we could, you know, like just cover the, the basic costs of that. And so they've given us a grant to, to do that. Any, any high school students here? Say thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. This is good. Um, okay. And so everybody check your cell phone. Turn it off. Da -da -da -da. And uh, there'll be questions afterwards and so forth. So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, somebody who's again been a, a supporter and, and a, a key uh, engineer in the state of Oregon for a long time uh, with Hewlett Packard, and then and then uh, now he's he's the uh, president and executive director of ONAMI, which is the Oregon Nanoscience and Microtechnologies Institute, uh, which is supporting a bunch of companies and research that's related to uh, tonight's uh, presentation, which makes it appropriate for Skip to be uh, to give the introduction. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. If you had the assignment of identifying the most qualified speaker in nanoscience research and application, I do not think you could do better than ISF has done tonight with Dr. Paul Olivasatos. I encourage you to read the biography of Dr. Olivasatos in your program, but I'd also like you to know um, that he's had a great impact on the state of Oregon. You'll see that he is one of the founders, the founder of the Quantum Dot Corporation, and I think you'll learn tonight what a quantum dot is if you don't know already. That company is now in Eugene, Oregon. It is part of Life Technologies. Dr. Olivasatos is also on the board of Selexent, um, a very interesting solar technology company that has announced plans to build a facility in Gresham, Oregon. And then finally, um, and this is a nice Portland story, one of Dr. Olivasatos' former students, Dr. Juanita Curtin, is the chief technology officer of Pacific Light Technologies, which is a very promising startup located in the Portland State Business Accelerator um, that's going to change the way you light your home and your business with light emitting diode technology. So um, Dr. Olivasatos has trained great people that are making contributions to our state. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Olivasatos. Well, good evening. Thank you, Skip, and thank you, Terry, for uh, this very kind invitation to come here and, and spend some time with you this evening and to tell you a little bit about the field of nanoscience and the specific sub-area of nanocrystals and to give you a feeling for what this area of science is like. I think we'll have some fun and hopefully you'll come away um, knowing a few key concepts about this very interesting area of science. In fact, uh, here are the things that I hope you'll remember uh, when we finish up. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever had the opportunity, some of you might have, old Saturday Night Live skits were done by Father Guido Sarducci, and he would, <laughs> hey, all right, <laughs> and, and he would, uh, he, he, one of his most uh, famous skits was the Five Minute University, and the goal of the Five Minute University uh, was to teach you in five minutes everything that you would remember from a normal university five years after you finished your degree. <laughs> And uh, so the five-minute university version of nanoscience is on this page. It's got scaling laws, and I'm going to explain what those are, and it's going to tell you a little bit about how to make the building blocks of na nanoscience. The power of one, which will have a particular meaning in the field of nanoscience, because the ability to observe single objects is a, a really a very key part. Uh, the very, very deep connection between nanoscience and biology these are uh, our nanomaterials, are artificial materials that we make, uh, but they're the same size as the fundamental building blocks of bio biological systems. And therefore, there's new opportunities uh, for us to, um, to have interactions between artificial materials and biological systems that arise in nanoscience. And finally, to give you a feeling for where we stand, the current era of building. So those are the themes that you're going to see tonight, and we're going to work our way through them, but we're going to start way back in history uh, at uh, one of the um, uh, earliest stages of, uh, of, of thought, really, philosophical thought, and that is uh, uh, the concept of successive division. We're going to just start with Democritus. And if you know, Democritus, a famous Greek philosopher, was the first person 
to intuit the idea that there are atoms. And, and the way he did that, way before any of them could be observed or even really scientifically demonstrated, he did it through a thought experiment. Democritus thought about, say, let's take a piece of a metal, let's say gold, take a piece of gold and chop it in two. And he reasoned that the two pieces of gold would really be fundamentally the same. They'd both be gold. And uh, you could chop them in two again and again. But he was able to intuit the idea, which turns out to be true, that eventually, uh, actually, if you keep chopping matter into two pieces over and over and over again, eventually you'll get down to such a small size that actually you'll come down to a point where matter is intrinsically grainy. And when you chop it in two, the next division won't be quite exactly the same. And eventually you'll get down to the fundamental underlying component of matter, the atom. And in fact, what atom means in Greek is indivisible. It's that which cannot be divided. And um, that's, of course, uh, the successive division thought experiment of Democritus, um, which actually, it turns out, is extremely prescient because nanoscience actually feeds off of the concept of successive division. What we do in nanoscience is we take a piece of matter and we break it in two, and we keep doing that over and over again, and we look at what happens at each different size regime and see if it's the same as the one before, if it's the same as the bulk matter, and, uh, or if it's different. Uh, in fact, if you like, uh, today in modern electronics, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that um, periodically, uh, every 18 months or so, uh, the feature sizes on computer chips get smaller and smaller. Actually, we're starting to enter into an era where it's not really possible to get smaller anymore. Um, but uh, over many generations of computers, that's been the case. Uh, each time, the feature sizes would become about half. And if you like, that's finally technology catching up in practice to really doing what Democritus wanted uh, of successive division, making each little feature size smaller and smaller. And in fact, it's true that when you make the little features on the surface of a computer smaller and smaller, when they get really tiny where they are today, uh, each time you chop them in half, actually everything comes out a little bit different. Uh, and if you take a piece of gold and you chop it in two, and if it's only 20 atoms across, and then if it's only 10 atoms across, actually those two are not the same anymore. If you go and look up the properties of gold in a book or online in one of the catalogs that tells you all the properties of gold, it will list the melting temperature, for example. And it turns out that if you take a piece of gold and it's only 100 atoms across and then uh, 40 and 20 and 10 and so on, and you measure the melting temperature, they actually won't be the same. And those are actually the basis of the scaling laws. There are many scaling laws that describe how basic properties of materials change with each successive division. So here you can see lists of some examples where there are known scaling laws like melting temperature. We're gonna do melting temperature, charging energy, and band gap. Those are three uh, scaling laws that we're gonna encounter in this lecture today. But there are many others, and these scaling laws qualitatively provide a rule of thumb for understanding the properties of matter when it becomes really tiny. And so they're very, very basic to the science uh, of, of nanomaterials. And in fact, because the properties of matter depend so strongly upon the size when they're very, very tiny, it means that the control of size, if we can very, very precisely control size and shape of nanoscale materials, then we can have a new class of materials with different properties than those of the conventional materials that we're used to working with. So that's very important for making new stuff. Now, I'll start with a little bit of an anecdote. When I started to work in this area, um, I went, um, I had been a graduate student at Berkeley and I went to work at Bell Laboratories in, in, in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And at that time, uh, many physicists were studying these scaling laws by taking a very sophisticated technology in which they would uh, really, really precisely control the compositions of gases down to the most precise that they could and then deposit those gases to make films uh, of two-dimensional films of very, very controlled thickness. And that was called molecular beam epitoxy. And when a uh, very large scale complex apparatus. And, and when we um, would go to our laboratories where I was in, in, in Bell at that time, 
there's this long, long corridor, and we would walk down this long corridor, and on both sides there would be these MBE, molecular beam epitaxy machines, and they would just be one after another, and they were making beautiful structures and doing incredible physics and really understanding the scaling laws at a deep level. But I was part of a little group there with my, my uh, mentor, Lewis Bruce, and some others um, who are listed here on the page. We were part of a little group that was uh, tasked, in a sense, with the idea of saying, could you grow these uh, materials that are dimensionally controlled in a conventional liquid flask by a very low-tech means? Just take some stuff and mix it together and have the same thing occur. And there were lots of reasons to think that that was not going to work. In fact, I remember distinctly uh, sitting at a lunch with a very well-established theoretical physicist who knew an awful lot more than I did about most everything. And, and you know, we were talking about my project, and he you know, thought about it for a little while. He was willing to sit there and spend some time with me. And then he said, you know, Paul, I really recommend that you leave this project. And it was just very disconcerting. And, and, and I said, well, why? And he goes, well, you know, look, there's so much effort goes into achieving purity of these materials to have them all be pristine. Uh, when you have these liquids and you're mixing them together, you can never achieve that level of precision of the material uh, such that you could have um, uh, really high quality stuff. So, so, so run away. Um, but it turned out he was wrong, and he was wrong because he didn't appreciate all the scaling laws. And this is a very common story in science. People who know a lot about things will have ideas uh, that are preconceptions because they haven't thought deeply enough about a topic yet. And so it's perfectly all right to have a big disagreement and go off and try something and see what happens. Sometimes when you try things, okay, <laughs> sometimes when you try things, they come out different than people thought they would. In our case, the reason that he didn't know to get it quite right was because he didn't appreciate that the melting temperature depends so strongly upon the size. And so let me just explain that very quickly. You can see here a graph that shows um, the um, melting, oops, I went backwards, sorry. Here you can see the melting temperature as a function of size for a crystal. And you can see that as the, as the crystal becomes quite small, the, 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 the um, temperature of melting really, really drops off a lot. That's an enormous change in the melting temperature. Um, of those crystals. Why does that happen? Well, you can understand that right away. Think of each atom in the crystal as holding arms with the one next to it. And just as you can imagine, if you've got a lot of people with their arms linked together, they become a much more stable kind of grouping. It's harder to break them apart and to jostle them when they're all uh, tightly held together. That's true for crystals as well. In fact, the n one atom will hold not just its neighbor, but its next neighbor over to a degree. So they really all kind of lock together uh, quite well, and so you know that's a that's a that's an example of a scaling law. In fact, just to put a number on it, the melting temperature will go uh, roughly like the surface to volume ratio because the more atoms are on the surface, they're not bonded to anything else; they're kind of more weakly held in. So as you have more surface, the melting temperature uh, will become more significant, and that scales like one over the radius, roughly. You know, and so so that so my physicist friend at that time didn't know that these crystals would melt at lower temperatures. Now, so why is that important for making high quality material, which of course, in order to really have an impact, the material has to be good stuff, right? Why is that important? Well, here's another scaling law that everybody has encountered at one time or another, or I hope that you do if you haven't, and that is the experience of going to buy a diamond in the diamond store. Uh, if you do that, you'll very, very quickly find that there's a certain size of diamond you can afford. <laughs> And you could say, well, I want to double it, and it's no dice. And you could say, well, make the half the size, and you could buy a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so, so why is that? Well, OK, there's a, here's a scaling law from De Beers. Uh, big diamonds are much rarer, so a diamond of double the weight costs four times more. That's an economic uh, scaling law. But it turns out that it's actually uh, very deeply ingrained with this aspect of nanoscience, if you like. What, what, why is a big diamond? Uh, so much more rare. Well, if you imagine that there's a defect in a crystal, you have to wait for a while while the crystal is warm to anneal the defect out. And, and that will take time. And the bigger the crystal, the longer that will take. And that's why a very big diamond of very high quality is very rare. It takes a long time to anneal out any defects that might have formed in it so they become quite rare objects. But turn that upside down, 
and you think about it for a minute, and what it says is actually, if you make a tiny crystal, it's very easy to anneal out all the defects. All you do is have to heat it up to a modest temperature, uh, and we saw the melting temperature is low. You just heat it up a little bit, all the defects go out, and you can make a very, very perfect small crystal very easily. And actually, it turns out that for nanocrystals, the kinds of materials that I've been studying, uh, you can make extremely high-quality nanoparticles very, very cheaply and very, very easily, which was quite an unexpected result. And so um, another scaling law to tell you about now, because here you can see an image. Uh, this is an image of little crystals. Uh, each one of these dots is a tiny little crystal. And here you can see one of those blown up and you can just count the atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. It's, you know, however many that is across there. That's how big that one is. And, and it turns out that we learned uh, by the methods that we developed over the years how to make these uh, all the different sizes. And, and we saw something very beautiful. Every different size that we made, the smaller the crystal, the color would change from red to yellow to green and blue and so on. It would just go all the way across the visible. That was not just the melting temperature changing with size now, but the color of the crystal was changing due to its band gap. The band gap of the semiconductor was changing as a function of the size. And that uh, has led people to call these particular materials artificial atoms or quantum dots. Okay, so these are little quantum dots because they're exhibiting a quantum scaling law as a function of the size. No, oops, did I skip that? Oops, sorry, I'm missing one slide here. I gotta just do this by saying it. If I, if I look at uh, this material and I uh, look at what makes its color, the color arises when the system absorbs light and makes an extra electron and hole inside there. All the electrons are bound normally, holding the atoms together. When a photon is absorbed, when light is absorbed by the crystal, it breaks one bond and that electron will circulate throughout this crystal. And that's a quantum object, that electron. And the smaller the object, the higher the energy of the electron in there. Let me give you an analogy for that very quickly. Uh, maybe many of you have been to the museums where you can drop a penny in this uh, 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 round-shaped, funnel-shaped object that will go around and around, the ball will go around and around. And as it goes in more and more, it will go faster and faster and faster as it goes in towards the center. Uh, if you like, that's what's happening with the electron in this crystal, is the smaller the crystal, the faster the electron moves around inside there. And that's a quantum effect, and it manifests itself as this very beautiful change in the colors of the crystal, or the change in the band gap as a function of the size. That's the quantum size effect. Well, it turns out that uh, that's a real effect, and uh, we were able, um, in the years subsequent to that, to learn how to make these tiny crystals uh, very, very uniform and very, very bright so that they would luminesce with a really uh, very high intensity. They could emit colors all the way across the spectrum, uh, many different colors. And a good friend of mine, uh, Shimon Weiss, uh, came to me one day and said, you know, these could be used for biological labeling. So uh, here's an example where we've taken these tiny crystals, they're about uh, 10 atoms or so across, and uh, we've encapsulated them in some shells so that they're really um, uh, insulated completely from the biological environment, but they can enter into it. They're the size of a protein, and therefore, here you could see a case where we took these little pieces of semiconductor and we put them inside a cell. In this case, one size, this was the first imaging experiment done with quantum dots. This one is uh, decorating the actin fibers in a cell with a large size crystal and the histone proteins in the nucleus with another size. So one is red and the other is green and we could in that way do a biological labeling experiment with these tiny inorganic materials. And what I want to emphasize here is these are the same materials that some very sophisticated uh, solid state electronics could be made out of. But now they're freestanding isolated tiny crystals small enough the size of a protein that they can be introduced inside a cell and therefore do in that environment a kind of diagnostic function. So um, as was mentioned by Skip, this ultimately became the basis of a technology. And the reason that it's an interesting technology is because people want to label cells all the time. And here you can see a cell labeling with an organic dye. Uh, 
And of course, you're all familiar with what happens with organic dyes. Um, I know that here in Portland, like in Berkeley, there are people who will wear tie-dye t-shirts and stuff like that. And if you do that and you put it out in the sun, it will fade after a little while. The dyes will all fade. But as you can see here, the two movies running at the same time, these, these uh, inorganic little crystals will not fade at all. And, and that's a big deal if you're trying to do a biological staining experiment. You want to see what happens during a biological process. You don't want the dye to fade while you're trying to observe it. And that became, of course, the basis ultimately for Quantum Dot Corporation, which was bought by Invitrogen, which is here in Oregon. And then that became, of course, Life Tech. So, um, you can make many different colors of these things and use them to stain and label cells pretty colors. Um, it turns out that there's more to it than that, that there's lots of reasons for this to be interesting for the biologists. For example, if you put nanoparticles inside one of these cells and you can then uh, have the cell divide, the cell will equally partition the quantum dots or the little nanocrystals between them. And uh, that means that you could load a cell up with a certain number of these objects and as they divide and divide, there'll always be some in there and you can track this cell and say, oh, that's one of the cells that started out green or that's one of the cells that started out red. Why would you want to do that? Well, here's an example of such an experiment where a friend from UCSF has, is making in uh, tissue culture, uh, it takes a, you take a breast cell and you put it in a gel and it divides, and it divides and divides, and eventually it will make a little, like a little breast gland that you can see here, one of these. And so we can put some green quantum dots inside these cells. These are all the healthy breast cells. And we can take some cancer cells into which we've introduced some red quantum dots. And when the cancer cell comes up and touches the breast cells, they, uh, I can always tell you which one was red and which one was green. So um, over hundreds and hundreds of divisions, I can tell you later on which one was which and which one started where and how they were tracked. So that's an example of a cell tracking experiment, which in some cases now are being done for as long as four, five, and six months, which enable then the scientists to understand things like what might happen with stem cells, where do they go, things of that type. So it's, it's a useful technology for the biological world. I'm gonna switch gears now and um, <clears throat> As uh, you may notice, uh, these days I'm playing some role at the Berkeley Lab, uh, trying to help organize research there relating to energy and environment. So the second area in which our nanoscale materials might turn out to have some application relates to renewable energy. Oopsie, sorry. Relates to renewable energy. And so if here are some of the research projects going on at Berkeley Lab relating to uh, renewable energy. For example, there's work in combustion and energy efficiency and energy storage. And there's one topic down here called artificial photosynthesis. And that's the topic I'm gonna cover for the remainder of this uh, discussion. So first, let's take a quick look at uh, some issues of solar. Um, this shows the power consumption of the United States uh, as a function of an area. We'll talk about the area momentarily. But the United States consumes approximately 3.3 terawatts of uh, power. That's the 3.3 you know, terawatts, that's a certain number. Now, uh, let's say that we take all of the sunlight that's hitting uh, a certain part of the United States, and at some efficiency, we converted it into a usable energy. So we'll just pick arbitrarily this number of 60 million acres. Uh, why would I pick that number? Well, it turns out that's about a quarter of all agricultural land. It's a vast amount, okay? And we'll say, okay, that's the most you're gonna probably wanna devote to energy, 60 million acres. And so we'll take that area and we'll say, okay, let's say that I convert all those energy from the solar energy, all the photons hitting it, I convert that to a usable fuel at a certain percentage. For example, if 1% of the solar photons got converted to usable energy, and it was 60 million acres, then at 1%, that would be equal to all power from US from gasoline. If it was 7%, that would be equal to all US power, period. So you get a feeling, okay, 60 million acres, not bad. The only hitch on here is if you look at a plant, uh, like a, a agricultural crop, the fastest growing plant, 
will take the energy of sunlight and convert it into biomass, usable uh, energy, at about a power efficiency of 0.3%. So that's a line down here. And that line, oh, somewhere over here would become equal to power from gasoline. So you'd have to use essentially all, or a big chunk of the uh, area that we use to make food to get gasoline because the power efficiency of making crops just isn't all that high. Now, I do think that with existing biofuel technology, you might be able to supplant 15% of our gasoline consumption, but we would like to get much more out of solar. And uh, so if we could get it up to three, four, 5%, that would be even better. And of course, with artificial structures, that's possible. It's much harder to do with a, with a biofuel. I do want to say at the outset, I'm about to give a description of a project, which is a far out project. I do want to say at the outset that if one wanted to, you could just use uh, solar and make electricity, and then with electricity, use it to make fuel. There is a possible way to do that, and that's not what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to talk about a far out, far reaching project which is to try to replicate what a plant does. This shows the inside of a photosynthetic membrane. And there are um, many scientists around the world, including those at uh, Caltech and Berkeley who have joined together in our Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. What we would like to do is copy what happens in the membrane of a photosynthetic cell, but do it in an artificial context, in an artificial material, completely made from inorganic stuff that would perhaps have a much greater power efficiency than plants. So that if we uh, spread that out, uh, we could make fuel rather than electricity, directly make fuel. So now that requires that we make some new crystals. And I'm going to tell you a little story of making new crystals. I remember I told you that a nanocrystal could be thought of as an artificial atom. It had quantum size effects. So if I have many atoms linked together, that would make an artificial molecule. So we're going to make an artificial molecule, and we're going to follow a, a virtuous cycle. We're going to learn how to build something. We're going to look at the quantum behavior, and we're going to measure at the single molecule level, and we're going to follow that around and around to try to get good at what we're doing. Now, here are all the little crystals that we have learned how to make. You'll remember, you'll recognize this one from before. That was the first artificial atom, quantum dot, nanocrystal, uh, that we made years and years ago that became the basis of the biological imaging. But in the years since then, we learned how to make all of these funny shapes here. Look at them. There's branchy ones. There's striped ones. There's hollow ones where there's holes in the middle. There's ones nested like Russian dolls, one crystal completely inside another. There's ones that show these funny branch-like structures. If you're a, a scientist, you could these look like P and F orbitals and stuff. So you know all different kinds of shapes and so on uh, that these things can, can make. And um, I'm reminded a little bit of a famous uh, phrase of uh, Rutherford, very famous physicist, who once said, uh, there are only two uh, branches of science, physics, and stamp collecting. <laughs> and uh, although I'm trained as a chemist and a material scientist, I agree wholeheartedly with him. There really are only two versions. And this is the stamp collecting version, OK? <laughs> and I'm very proud of these stamps that we collect. <laughs> and the fact is, um, we could never have uh, made science out of this. In other words, there could never be physics in this field if we had not first collected the stamps. So we went through a period when we made crystals and we learned how to control their shapes very, very intricately. And then we went back and understood how they formed more and more. And we made physics or science out of it. So uh, the way we've done that has been by over time conceptualizing a few definite types of reactions, a very small number of chemical transformations which could be applied to these nanocrystals in a very systematic, orderly kind of way. And I'm going to show you the example of branching because that's going to tie in with the artificial photosynthesis. Now, here it gets a little bit technical, and hopefully you'll follow OK and not be discouraged because it's actually quite not too complicated, I'm hoping. Uh, what we want for artificial photosynthesis uh, 
is a direction. Well, why do I say that? Um, if you think about the photosynthetic membrane, it absorbs light and it transfers charges across the membrane. And it's very important that it send the electron in one direction and the absence of an electron a hole in the other and not the other way around. And once it does that, it performs a reduction on one side and an oxidation on the other. So that's very, very important that it has a directionality to it. And normally when we make materials in spontaneously in a liquid flask, we don't have any direction. So how could we get a directionality to energy flow in our systems? Well, we grew a material, a semiconductor material, which makes a little hexagonal crystal, but it has the property that the top and bottom of the hexagonal barrel are not atomically identical. One is a little bit different than the other. And we grew these crystals inside a medium that had an organic additive. It's just a special molecule that was present inside there. And when we did that, it made, instead of those quantum dots, for 15 years people made a certain recipe and they always made these round crystals. And I have to be honest and say by accident one day, we had the wrong stuff there. And it had this phosphonic acid stuff in there. And when we did that, suddenly these crystals all came out uh, not to be round anymore, but to be these nice elongated objects. And we were happy because we could study the quantum size effects in them because now we would see that the properties would depend on the diameter but not the length because we were, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the wavelength of the electron being only comparable to the diameter and not the length. But interestingly, when we looked at these funny crystals, what we found is sometimes they would have these funny little stacking faults in them. So these crystals, you could think of these as having layers in them, and there were two ways the layers could stack, ABAB or ABCABC. And uh, right here you can see examples of the ABAB stacking all over here, but here are some ABC stacks. That's an ABC stack, it goes ABC, and this is an ABABAB. And so these crystals would sometimes be in one stack and sometimes in another. And we noticed that this stacking would sometimes take place always on one end, uh, but not the other end. It just didn't seem random. And in fact, by playing around, eventually we learned how to make them so that they would always ABC stack at the beginning and then always AB stack later. And when we did that, it turned out to our surprise that we ended up making these crystals that were branched. They had this nice little tetrahedrally shaped object in the center and then these arms projecting out. So here you can see one, there are four arms actually. There's a fourth one kind of sticking out at you here from the page. And these ones look a little messy, but we played with them more and more and we got to where we could make these branchy crystals. So here you can see crystals that branch and you can make them longer, you can make the diameters larger. And uh, for us, this was the happiest part of our stamp collecting phase because we were making these crystals. And I don't know if you've, any of you, how many have taken a chemistry class ever, but when you take a chemistry class, the first thing they do is they give you these little models, right? And in the models, you build your atoms and you stick little things in between to make them. And uh, the best atom that you get is the carbon atom, which has four things coming out at the tetrahedral angle. So imagine how happy we are. We're making a crystal that's got four things coming out at the tetrahedral angle, and we figure, gosh, we can just build all kinds of stuff once we've made this. This is a good deal. So uh, that's our stamp collecting phase. Again, quantum size effects here. Uh, because the electron wavelength, again, in this material is a few nanometers, uh, when we change the widths of the arms, we would see a huge change in the color in the band gap of this material. But when we change the lengths now, there'd be absolutely no change because the arm length is already large compared to the wavelength of the electron in this quantum material. And we played, we could make things that would double branch uh, where we could make them branch a second time and that, that was a happiness for us. And we even learned how to have branches where we could have one material in the center and a second one on the arms. So this is, oops, sorry. So this is a case where we have one material in the center and a different semiconductor material in each one of the arms. And these materials are now selected in such a way that when charges are created inside them, they'll flow to a particular part. And we could make it so it either would branch or so that it would just extend. Here's a case 
where it goes ABC stack in the middle and then AB stacks on the arms, that makes a branch point, or it would just be AB stacks everywhere, but there was one material uh, at this one spot. You can kind of see it bulging there. That's one material, and then the other material would stick out from the two sides. And if you recall, I mentioned to you the two faces on this are not identical. One grows much faster than the other. And you can kind of see the bulgy part is always towards one side in these, okay? It's never quite in the middle. That's because it grows faster in one direction than the other. So um, this, these two materials now are something we can build something out of. And uh, this one we're gonna try to build something uh, for artificial photosynthesis out of. And this one we're gonna do something else with because we made it and we need to think of something to do with it. Now you remember I mentioned to you that they grow much faster on one side than the other. So um, one of my former uh, colleagues, Uri Banin, who's a professor in Jerusalem, he figured out how to grow little metal tips on the ends of these guys. So now we've got uh, semiconductor material and on the very end of it we can grow a little metal tip and you can decide it can be whatever metal tip you choose right on the end there. So now let's think about this artificial photosynthesis briefly. I mentioned to you, if I have a membrane, I want it to be a biological membrane. This is the picture of the inside of all the proteins doing incredible business when they absorb light. And actually, if you look at this thing, it's very intricate, and people are still trying to figure out each one of these steps. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable what happens in the natural photosynthetic system. It's way beyond the ability of people to design a system on that scale far beyond what we could do today. We're reverse engineering and making our own, but we can't do things at the same level of sophistication. But you will notice this directionality of energy flow. And then you ask the question, why should this be a nanoscale object? And it turns out there's some very good reasons for that that have to do with balancing out um, the uh, quantum size effects and the photostability. Uh, basically, if you have a very, very, if you remember that dye molecule I showed you earlier that bleached out, it's a very, very small molecule. When the light comes in and it gets uh, excitation in it, every so often, it's so, such a small object, every so often it just breaks. If you put a lot of energy into a tiny thing, occasionally it's going to break. Um, so uh, na nature makes its building blocks uh, just big enough that they'll be relatively photostable, but um, uh, not too big. Turns out if they're too big, the charges will delocalize over an enormous distance and later on you want to do photochemistry which means localizing the bonds in a specific spot. So uh, you can see that there's these kind of uh, uh, countervailing forces that lead you to want to make a nanoscale object if you're going to do very sophisticated artificial photosynthesis. So we're going to try to cap copy that uh, in our system. So how are we going to do this? I told you these two structures we made. One of them was a quantum rod where we have a dot embedded inside the rod with a metal on the end. And this one has a directionality of energy flow. When light gets absorbed, it's going to send the electron over to this piece of metal and the hole is going to stay behind here. A reduction can happen here and an oxidation on this side. And that's our elementary unit of artificial photosynthesis. This one is very symmetric, so no good for photosynthesis. It doesn't have a directionality. And so instead, uh, in order to make lemonade out of it, we're actually going to just um, do what scientists like to do. Since we made something, we're gonna try to squish it. And it turns out when you, you, know, you just get kind of frustrated, you go and you bang on the thing. Uh, when you bang on this thing, it bends the arms, and it turns out the fluorescence changes color when you bend its arms. So you can use it to measure forces. Okay, so here's an example of taking these, uh, these little semiconductor objects, we put them in water, we shine light on them, electrons go to this side, and they can be used to split the water and make hydrogen, and the holes go to this side, and in this case, there's just a sacrificial oxidant there. We're not making oxygen, which is what you would really have to do in order to truly split water. It's just a practice experiment right now, but what you can see is that as we change the distance between where this quantum dot is and where the metal is, we increase the efficiency of making the hydrogen. And so that's a good sign. It means that we're controlling the separation of the charges, just like it happens in the natural system. 
nowhere near as good as the natural system yet. And of course, we want to be much better than it one day. But um, it gives you a feeling for uh, what it is that we can try to do. Uh, am I going to tell you about this? Well, I promised you a scaling law. I'm going to just say this very briefly. We can study these things one at a time. They're so, this object, when the metal's not there, is incredibly bright. When you shine light on it, it will shine light back at you. It will emit light out very, very efficiently. So now, even when it's doing photochemistry, if an electron falls into the platinum and a hole goes over here, then no light comes out. Uh, that's an inverse proxy for the photo, photo uh, chemistry. In other words, if it's absorbing light and not emitting any, it's doing photochemistry. It's off making molecules instead of uh, emitting the energy back out as light. And we can track that process. And I mentioned to you the scaling law associated with metals. Mm, so I teach you, I'm going to teach you that really quick, OK? And then we'll stop. So if I have a little piece of metal and I stick an electron on it, I made it more charged. Now you'll remember, I hope, that if I have two charges that are like, two like charges, they repel each other. If I take a plus charge up to another plus charge, it wants to move away, right? So now here's a famous scaling law for charging energy. It says if I have a very little metal object and I put a charge on it, and then I go to put another one on, I'll feel that repulsion. And the smaller the crystal, the bigger the charging energy, the bigger the energy I have to overcome to add an additional charge, because that first charge is on a very small volume. And the smaller that volume, the more they'll feel each other, the two, when they're right on top of each other. So the charging energy, again, scales like one over the radius of a tiny crystal. And that shows up inside these objects. When we shine a lot of light on them, it turns out they stop working because you can't get any more electrons to go into this little metal. You put in one, you can't get a second one to go in because um, it feels the repulsion. And so we can see the scaling law showing up uh, in the photochemistry when we drive it really hard. I also mentioned to you we're going to take these objects, these tetrapods, these branchy guys. Uh, we're, they're made, they're cousins. The, the, the long one that's directional and the symmetric one that's branched, they're made in almost the same way. Just in one case, it's all AB, AB stack. In the other case, it's ABC, and then it shifts to AB. Other than that, they're the same. So we wanted to use these things, and we did that by taking them, and we take them, and for example, here you can see we put it inside a piece of plastic, and when you stretch the plastic, the color of the light that they emit changes as you stretch on the plastic, and you can use that as a sensor. Now, uh, you remember I mentioned to you many times the biology collection. It turns out uh, biologists would really like to be able to measure forces inside biological things. And they'd like to be able to do that with light, shine light in and measure the force locally somewhere. And so it turns out our objects will bend with a force of about, oh, 10, 20, 30 nanonewtons. It's a number that means nothing to anyone. But uh, the fact is, <laughs> the fact is, if you, if you remember, that, um, remember that image I showed you at the beginning where there was a, a, a breast, a uh, little breast gland, artificial breast gland grown in artificial culture, and there was a cancer cell poking into it. When one cell pushes on another, it pushes with a force of about 20, 30, 40 nanonewtons. Okay? So that's the force that one cell exerts upon another. So what we've built is a little object here, which when one cell pushes on another, if this thing is sitting in between it, it can report on that force, because when the arms bend, we'll see a color change. And so here's an example. We're just starting to do this work now. But there's a little mouse heart cell here beating on the substrate of these particles. And every time it beats, the color changes. And you can kind of watch the color, the heartbeat, by looking at the color change. It's a practice experiment because it changes periodically. And hopefully, you know, five years from now, we'll have this uh, being done in a, in a laboratory where it's being used to measure uh, the force that a, a, a cell exerts when it's trying to leave a tissue and become metastatic, you know, what a cell exerts on the tissue around it. So that's, in a sense, this uh, loop that I showed you, build on the nanoscale, control the quantum behavior, measure at the single molecule behavior, and go around and around. Now, I want to emphasize as my last topic that this is a normal cycle. And things turn, and they change, and every time the technology changes, and, 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 and I think it was Skip who mentioned, or was it uh, Terry who mentioned FEI? I want to thank FEI, if there's anyone here from FEI, 
Uh, you, all the pictures I showed you were taken mostly on FEI microscopes here tonight. Yes, indeed. Uh, okay. And, and now I'm going to show you um, something that's uh, a, a really another level of the microscopy. Now, for many years, we grew these particles in those flasks, right? But uh, now we've got a system where we're able to grow these particles in a liquid cell that's in the electron microscope. So these are little crystals that are forming in the liquid, but we're imaging them directly as they form, okay? And um, for us, this is a huge happiness because um, because for years we made these crystals, but we didn't really know how they formed. And now we're taking pictures of how they're forming. And so here are, these are platinum crystals, they're little metals. And what you'll see here is that every so often, two, there's one, they just, see those two just merged? And, and, and these two merged and so on. And this was our state of the art just two years ago in this business. Now, I don't know how many of you follow what happens in the science world. A couple of years ago, there was a Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of graphene. Actually, it's a fascinating story because, I mean, maybe you know this. You know, take a piece of graphite. The first experiment was taking a piece of graphite and a piece of uh, scotch tape, sticky tape, and you just picked it up. <laughs> and lo and behold, there was one layer of carbon, only one. And it turned out it has beautiful physics properties and it led to a Nobel Prize in physics. Terrific. Um, it turns out that just a couple of years later, with my friend Alex Zettel in physics, we've got, so this was one microscope image. Here you see the same movie taken three years later, but where the windows of the cell are now one monolayer, one layer of carbon, exactly one layer of carbon thick is the window of the cell that's encapsulating the liquid and we're able to image the growth of the particles directly in the electron microscope because the contrast is so good now, we're not having to go through a thick window that was making the contrast really, really poor. So this is a, a great thing for us and I'll just show you a quick last example. Uh, this shows a crystal that just grew all by itself by adding atoms to it. This shows a crystal that grew, and here it fused with another crystal. And this was from our paper in 2009. It was the first movie of nanoparticle growth that was obtained in a liquid. And, and, and it shows this coalescence event. And then you'll notice there was this period of time here where it almost looks like the crystal just stopped growing for a while. And then it sort of caught up again and kept going. And so it's like it fused, kind of took a break, then it started to grow again. Whereas this one, and they ended up almost exactly the same size. And, and so that was the older movie at the low resolution. And then the, the new movie at a high resolution now, we can go in and observe it as it's happening. So here are two crystals and they kind of get really close to each other. And what happens is they're, 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 they've got some molecules that coat the outside of them. There's two crystals and they're kind of moving around and they come and they dock and they start hitting each other constantly. And as they're hitting, they're kind of rotating. And then suddenly they find each other, oopsie, sorry, keep doing that. Suddenly they find each other and right there they docked. They suddenly hit and then they come together and they start to join with each other and then they become one crystal. And it turns out you can see the neck there. I hope you can see a neck there. And then you can see the length, right? So you just pull out your ruler and you say, okay, I'm gonna measure the neck and I'm gonna measure the length. And what you can see is the neck is getting uh, fatter and you can see the length from end to end is actually getting shorter. So what was happening to those crystals in that first movie was the two came together and the atoms are moving all around the outside and they come and they join and then they make one big crystal as they all kind of join together and they fuse. Well, turns out that's all fine, but if you look at the theories of crystal growth which have been out there forever, none of them have this process happening in it. So the minute we could take a picture, the first picture we took showed something that was not in any theory of crystal growth. And then the second picture we took actually starts to give us an explanation for what it is that might have been happening there. So I hope I gave you a little feeling for the science of nanocrystals uh, and for nanoscience by proxy. Um, uh, a little bit about, I didn't do the missing link scale, I'm sorry, but you saw the scaling laws uh, building blocks 
the power of one, for example, that last experiment I just showed you, instead of observing all these crystals in a flask, we can go in now and see each one, and I can say, okay, that's how this one grew. That's the power of one in nanoscience. It's very important. The deep biology connection, which is enormous, and the era of building. What we have learned how to do now is to make these tiny objects, and we're learning now increasingly how to pattern them in space by copying what happens in nature. That's the artificial photosynthesis example. And the better we get at that, the more sophisticated the things that we'll eventually be able to produce by these kinds of methods. And I'd like to leave you with a quote from the very, very famous, uh, essentially really the father of nanoscience in a sense, if it's not Democritus, it has to be Richard Feynman, who uh, gave the famous lecture, plenty of room at the bottom and so on. And, and he uh, has a very famous uh, uh, quote which says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And that's, of course, at the core of the field of nanoscience is about learning how to pattern and control matter on this very, very fundamental small length scale where really important physical properties first become manifested in the deepest of ways. And uh, so his, his thinking uh, influences us uh, every day. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Remember, I can't see you really, so. There's <laughs> one there, one there, and one up above. Okay. Here we go. Sure. Uh, a few years ago, I was, uh, I'm a layman, but I was interested in nanotechnology. I read up on it a lot. And they were growing uh, some nanotubes that they were going to use in, in um, you know, LEDs or something yes. like that. Did that technology ever materialize? Did they ever develop? Yes. So uh, these same quantum dots that I showed for the biological labeling uh, emit very beautiful colors. And um, they can be used for, um, for displays. And there's uh, a few different approaches. In one of them, you actually try like an inorganic LED to inject the charges electrically. But you can also just have a blue LED like what exists in a lot of other uh, solid state electronics and put a coating of these quantum dots on there uh, for green and uh, red and make a display that way. And they make some stunningly beautiful displays with very, very good color accuracy. They haven't yet hit the market, but uh, there are a number of manufacturers, very uh, high power manufacturers in the world who have some very nice prototypes. Uh, some at very large scale, and they're figuring out whether those will find their way into your uh, next cell phone or your next uh, whatever laptop and so on. It looks very promising. Uh, also, um, there was a mention uh, uh, earlier of uh, Pacific Light Technologies. You know, I think they're trying to make a coating that would go on. Um, uh, if you have a light emitting diode instead of your tungsten lamp, you know the light's a little harsh. It's not so pleasant. You can put a little coating of these quantum dots on there. They can change the spectrum to make it more pleasing. So, you know, there's, yes, it's happening. It's not quite there in everyday supermarket or uh, store, but it's going to be, I hope. I had um, actually thought tonight's talk would be about whether solar panels could be made efficient enough to solve some of our energy needs. Energy needs. Yes. It was a fascinating conversation, but I do want to ask you about renewable energy. Yeah. So I've asked a number of scientists who have come through here whether they think technological advances can help us address the looming crises that face human civilization this century. Some of them, are mostly the physical scientists, such as Brian Green, think, oh yes, technology will save us. The social scientists tend to be more pessimistic. They think when the technology breakthroughs, if they come through, might come too late, and we might not have the time, and um, we might not have the money to pay for those. A number of advanced um, economies are headed for bankruptcy. And of course, we saw how the food shortages led to yeah. the revolution in Egypt. So just wanted to get a yeah. general sense of whether you think revolutions and breakthroughs in the solar and various other technologies can help us address climate change and food shortages, you know, before, before it's too late. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I did flash up there very briefly. I have a separate presentation that I can give just on that topic, and it's a whole story, you know, and 
at Berkeley Lab, we have organized this Carbon Cycle 2.0 initiative, whose goal is really to provide as much as we can as a laboratory, as, as much science uh, as we can and as much understanding as we can to enable uh, a, 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 an approach that based on renewables and efficiency that could supply our energy needs in the future. Uh, let me say this as an answer. First of all, just so that I'm really clear on it, uh, about my views on this, uh, I do believe that um, the uh, energy system that we have today um, is perturbing the, the is perturbing our planet in ways that are uh, that are ones that we need to pay very very careful attention to and be deeply concerned about. And uh, I do think that uh, science and technology will play a role in that and help us have new ways of accessing energy. And uh, I also do believe that. Um, we have a lot of technology already that we could be deploying to a much higher degree than we are. So when you say that the social scientists are a little discouraged that the science may come too late, I'd almost feel about it a little bit differently. I feel like uh, the science and engineering is developing all the time and there's a lot there, but uh, our willingness to uh, uh, accept the issues that are there as serious social and political issues and then act upon them has not been as, uh, as, as good as we would like. So in fact, actually, it's as much of a social and political phenomenon as a technical one. <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we'll have deeper understanding of the underlying issues as time goes on uh, through education around the science that is there so that we can then move on to the discussion of how to start to do things that we know how to do. For example, if we deployed energy efficiency much more uh, systematically, if we had an energy policy that really tried to move us uh, towards dealing with the issues of climate change in a systematic way uh, through a variety of means that are available to us, uh, we'd, be, we'd be all doing uh, future generations a big favor. Ah, yes. So, as you said, there was the stamp collecting part of science where you found all the different nanocrystals and all the different shapes. I was yes. wondering if there were any more shapes than the three different shapes you listed and if there were any more uses for those different shapes, if yes. you had any. Yes, it's a good question. And the answer is, <clears throat> this is the part about stamp collecting. This is why Mr. Rutherford made his statement. It turns out once you start collecting stamps, there's a lot of them, <laughs> and, and you can keep collecting them. And indeed, there are other shapes. You can make disks, and disks may have some very interesting uses, and you can make uh, many other very, and I, I think I showed you the example of the nested particles, one completely inside another. Very interesting. And so you know, there are many, many shapes that can be made, and that's a very, um, uh, I, I am very attracted to that. I like to see making these complex shapes. Uh, but in truth also, there's a point where I feel like pulling back from it and saying, okay, now that I've made a bunch of shapes, I need to go back and understand how they all formed. And then once I have principles for how that happened, then I can predict how shapes will be created. And observing any specific shape is not as interesting as much as deciding what shape do I really want? And that's the cycle that science will often follow. Early on, it will just explore and see what are the facts, what happens really. And then a model and a theory will come about, an understanding, and then it becomes easier to design what you want. So, so your question is, is really right on. About, yes. Yes. Um, so you discussed the compatibility of these materials with biological systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there's a growing body of research in the field of nanotoxicology that's studying some of the novel toxic effects of these materials that go hand in hand with their therapeutic effects. Yes. So I was wondering what your insights are on that and if there's any related research going on at Lawrence Berkeley. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, your question is, again, right on. And, and, and in fact, uh, that's um, in all areas of science, we find that there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there are things that we learn how to do, 
and then we learn about their implications. And hopefully we, we learn slowly as a society how to have those two happen uh, in tandem in a constructive conversation. There's no doubt that uh, nanoscale materials can have special toxicologies. And um, this is what's been very complex in that field. It's kind of confounded us a little bit. We're used to a little bit being able to say, um, I have a certain, uh, just like I told you in the lecture, if I look up gold in the uh, you know, uh, CRC handbook or what's online now, it will list the melting temperature because there's one, it's a material that has one. And if I looked up the toxicological effects, I would think of them as being um, associated with a given material. But it turns out when you get down to these very tiny sizes, uh, the material composition is only one part of it. The formulation is as much a part of it as because it will control where it goes. To give you a feeling for that, I can take a material and embed it completely inside a solid matrix. Or I could have it coated with a hydrophobic uh, uh, coating or a hydrophilic coating or one that likes to attach to the outside of a cell or one that goes to the inside. And it could be the identical, identical material in the inside, the nanomaterial, but where it goes could be completely different. So when we've tried to develop the science of the toxicology, it's been confounded a little bit by that because of the complexity of having to learn how to develop uh, a language for dealing with the fact that the same material uh, could have extremely different effects depending on how it's formulated. And I think we're still nascent in learning how to, uh, how to develop that and how to, how to deal with it. Uh, I will say that very early on in the nanoscience field, when the National Nanotechnology Initiative was first formulated, people looked back at other examples where science, new science areas had started, and they said, you know, they didn't start studying the social implications early enough. So they set aside 5% of the budget to study the uh, implications, both for toxicology, health, and also other implications that exist uh, of the technology in the social dimension. Um, if I give a report card today to that whole effort, I would say the science part has still advanced more than the impacts part. We haven't developed as much as we should have there. And we need to think through more how as a society, as we develop new areas of science, we can become better at addressing the implications early. Um, so by, that's a long-winded answer uh, of saying that I believe there are important impacts. Uh, there are some wonderful new uh, groups, for example, Andre Nell and his colleagues at UCLA have really made some great progress in formulating underlying concepts for the toxicology issues. And, 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 and they're starting to understand how it's really got as much to do with formulation as it does with the actual composition of the material. So we're making progress. I wish we were much further along. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I wanted to ask you about nanomachines because the dream you know, was to, to have nanoscale machines building other things. Could you comment on how far along that's come or if there are examples of nanomachines producing other things? Uh, there's, um, <clears throat> there, there's really, in the sense of producing other things, I would say, to my opinion, there's no useful example or no example. Uh, so that's remained kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, it's not, it's not something anybody really knows how to do. Uh, there have been experiments where people have used uh, certain systems which can uh, undergo cycles of changing shapes that sort of look like uh, the kind of cycle that, uh, that, that, that you know, might be something like what, what a machine looks like. You might have a, uh, you know, an artificial DNA that can open and close in response to something and will follow a cycle in a sense. But, but the sense of what you consider to be a machine that builds something uh, I'm not aware of any example of that, and I think that we're, 
that, that's artificial, all artificial, you know, not built uh, using a microbe or something to do it. Uh, I don't think we're even close to something like that, frankly. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the temporal stability of, uh, of nanocrystals, in particular the ones that you were uh, discussing earlier uh, for photosynthesis and, and what that might say about the service life of a, of a system yeah. that, that were to be deployed? Yeah, no, so <clears throat> very good. Um, so as a, just to say a, a qualitative thing about that at, uh, up, uh, up at the front, um, we have some of the uh, early quantum dot samples that we would have made in the, say, uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s that are still functioning completely fine as light emitters. They're, they're quite bright and, and they're, they're still quite stable. But on the other hand, if I take one of these nanoparticles, I didn't have a chance to go into it today. I showed you the example of branching. But I can have another example that I would call exchange. I can have um, a, a semiconductor material that's sitting there as a little crystal. Say it's got a 1,000 atoms in it and I can have another atom type come in, and let's say it's an AB compound, two kinds of atoms, AB. I can exchange out all of the A atoms for atom C, and it will happen uh, in a fraction of a second. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the chemical stability depends on the detail on the exact conditions that have been created uh, around it. Uh, so they can be stable for decades, but they can also be made in such a way exposed to a chemical environment such that they can be destroyed in an instant. So, so there's not a general principle there that's a simple answer to that question. Now, with respect to your question on the stability of the artificial photosynthesis, uh, it's a very, very good point. The natural photosynthetic system <clears throat> is not all that stable. It, it, it bleaches out pretty quickly, and, and the natural system, the leaf, has to constantly be replacing the chlorophyll. All the chlorophyll molecules are replaced every, I forget how many minutes, you know, 15, 20 minutes. So it's really, you know, it's, it's constantly having to replace those things because they're, they're not so stable. The inorganic crystals have the potential to be very stable, but you have to manage it very, very, very carefully. And um, I, I didn't have time to go into it today, but some of the materials that we've used, uh, people tried, <clears throat> It's an important point. Let me just uh, let me back up slightly, and I'll come to it. Uh, this idea of artificial photosynthesis grabbed the imagination of scientists. Actually, in the um, uh, subsequent to the oil shock in the 1970s, and there was a spurt of research in that area uh, that happened, uh, and it continued uh, until just after 1980, when it was terminated uh, because of a decision to move away from doing that kind of, you know, renewables research. And so during that time, they studied some of the same materials that I showed today, but they were um, randomly configured. In other words, you take a, a semiconductor material and you might put the metal that I showed in random spots and then try and see how it behaved. And often they would find that they were not stable. In some of the work that uh, I didn't have a chance to go into the details of it today, but in that, that nano rod where we've got the metal sitting precisely at the tip and the whole scaven the whole capturing piece on the other end, um, that exact same material, if they're random, the components, will decay very, very quickly. But when they're positioned in exactly the right way and the charges are directed very precisely to go, it becomes a very stable material. What I mean to say by that then is, and, and, and is that as we learn how to control precisely the pathways that the energy follows as a function of the time, we can take materials which otherwise might appear to be unstable and have them be stable for a very long time. And, and, and so I think that's going to be the trick as to whether this idea will work. Now, I want to emphasize the artificial photosynthesis idea as I described it is still far off. I mean, we're not able to make a material yet that is able to achieve those goals. But this idea of controlling how energy flows versus time with great precision is underlying the thinking of how to make the materials stable enough that they could last for a long time. Yes. 
Yeah, uh, comparing nanotechnology with uh, several of the other technologies, for example, microprocessor technology, which I think is in full flight, and we heard the last lecture here, genomics, uh, yes. which has uh, come down from a billion dollars to $8,000 or something. Uh, I would say that is in a takeoff stage. So how would you say rate or uh, say nanotechnology compares to those technologies? Uh -huh. Well, you know, nanotechnology, uh, it's a funny business uh, to, to put, I mean, I, I share your desire to put that uh, bracket on it and to understand where it is. Uh, the reason it's a little bit of a tricky business is because it turns out, um, unbeknownst to us, we have been doing nanotechnology for a long time. For example, although they just went out of business recently, uh, Kodak, uh, all of that was really nanotechnology. Uh, just they didn't always have the ability necessarily to control quite at the level that's emerged in, in recent years. And also they didn't always have the ability to image at the level we want. Um, and if you look at today's uh, technologies uh, in integrated circuits, if you look at the field of catalysis, uh, several other fields, you know, in energy conversions, what, what we do for how we modify petroleum products and things like that, at their core are a variety of nanotechnologies. Um, so if you want to count those because they depend on nanoscale materials, uh, then it's a huge industry already. But if you want to say what has emerged from this very deliberate idea of precisely controlling quantum behavior, sizes, and so on, it's still nascent. The early products are things like the biological labeling ones. They're not a huge market today. Uh, things like the displays and solar are the next wave of those things. So we'll see a sort of more explicit aspect of it. It's still, it's still uh, you know, in a, in not, not there. It's nothing like the genomics situation which you just described where the revolution is just stunning, you know, not, not there yet. Um, I had to ask about how when you were talking about the crystalline bonds, they formed certain patterns. Yes. Well, if those bonds were to be broken, would they form different patterns or would they make the same pattern again? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And um, the, um, it's a very interesting question because one of the things that we like to do, for example, is to take one of the existing crystals and uh, let's say it's got two kinds of atom, an A and a B atom in it, and we're gonna pull all the A's out and put in C. <laughs> and that would be exactly what you're saying. We're gonna take a thousand bonds inside that crystal and break every single one of them and replace it with a different atom. <laughs> Uh, remarkably enough, you can take a small crystal uh, of about a thousand atoms and you can have it have a funny shape like one of those elongated ones or one of those branchy ones and you can pull out every single one of the pair of atoms and put a different one in and have it keep the same shape. Uh, which when we first saw that, uh, was a result that really surprised us and we hadn't thought that that would be the case. And yet, 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 yet that is what really happens. So it, it is possible to find a situation where you can break the bonds and have a new one form and it will be exactly the same. That's the premise of your question and that's correct. It's right on. But it is also possible to take a very small crystal and uh, start to do, just say you could do something else to it. Let's say you came in with very bright light and every time the light gets absorbed, it's like breaking one bond. And you just turn up the light more and more and more. And what happens is, uh, as you start to snip bonds in it, at a certain point, you'll break a fraction of the bonds. And it turns out that if you break, say, 15% of them, you know, uh, 15 out of every 100, uh, the crystal will suddenly completely collapse and it will be a different material at that point. So I think the answer is if you do the bonds one at a time and it's a big enough crystal, all the other atoms will hold it in place and you can bring another one in and just substitute it. But if you start breaking a whole bunch of them at once, it falls apart. <laughs>
for a while, so I'm, it's probably a little naive question, but uh, when you're building your stamp collection, do you use various surfactants and yes. various, uh, again, surf control the surface tension, all that kind of stuff? Yes. Okay. Yes, so it's all done with organic molecules that control uh, the surface energies, as you're saying. And in fact, I showed that one example where we had, we were growing roundish crystals for a long, long time. And then we added, we just changed one of the organic additives that's present in there, and the shape came out completely different. And that's because that molecule liked to bind selectively to one face of the crystal. And when it bound to that face, that crystal would now not grow as quickly because most of the time it had something bound to it, so a new atom couldn't get in there to add to it. And that's why you could make a rod shape uh, instead of, um, and, you know, a disc would be the opposite. You do selective adhesion on a different surface. So you're, you're exactly right. Okay, so you can use uh, like multi-dentate ligands and that's right. cycles too. That's right. Multi-dentate ligand will, will, will then uh, adhere more strongly. So uh, there's a, when you're trying to grow one of these crystals, what you want to have happen is a very delicate balance. There's organic, you, at the temperature of growth, you want the crystal to be reorganizing, atoms to be able to move around to anneal the defects out. And you also want to have these organic species weakly attached to the surface. Why is that? Because if two crystals hit each other, you never want them to fuse, although I showed you some fusion events and that's, okay, different, didn't, no one expected that. Okay, but <laughs> the party line would be, uh, you've got these organic molecules are coming on and off very rapidly, but on average they're present. So if two crystals collide, they can't fuse. And then when these organics are coming on and off, another atom can slip in when one's off and add onto that spot. So you have to very delicately choose the species that's binding to the surface. So it's just right at the temperature of the growth. And the temperature of the growth has to be set based on the size of the crystal because that depends on the, uh, you know, the melting temperature depends so critically on the size. So it's intricate. It's good to have you back in the Pacific Northwest, Dr. Alavisatos. Thank you. My uh, question has to do with carbon nanotubes. I'm, I'm fascinated by what appears to be uh, remarkable properties, both electrically and in terms of tensile strength. Yeah. Um, but my sense is that we haven't figured out how to grow them more than a few nanometers long in any particular um, nanotube. And, and do you see any um, advances in creating as long a, um, a bundle of carbon nanotubes as we might want to grow? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Nanotubes are incredible materials. And, uh, you know, there have been uh, really, when you think about nanoscale carbon, there have been two Nobel Prizes. Uh, Rick Smalley uh, and uh, uh, his colleagues were awarded a Nobel Prize for the discovery of Buckminster Fullerene, the round soccer ball shaped uh, carbon. And the nanotubes are essentially a relative of that. They take a piece of carbon and you just uh, graph, graphite sheet and you roll it up and if it's just the right size you know it'll roll up into a sphere with these pentagonal kind of things in it and the, the nanotubes are a related form of that but then I mentioned to you that really the wonderful prize uh, recently in physics for the perfectly fat flat carbon uh, single monolayer of graphene it turns out those single layers of graphene exhibit a very beautiful, wide-ranging set of behaviors. And it turns out those can be made, those single layers of graphene can be made in very large quantities, uh, very perfectly, uh, very beautifully. So it looks like the graphene is turning out to be, for the nanoscale carbon, uh, the material which will take off and really get studied a lot because it's so easy to control. The nanotubes, have beautiful properties, but when you fold it, um, it's like a piece of paper. Uh, you can fold it uh, so that the two edges come exactly onto each other, but you can also stagger it and make like a, a, a shift in it, and then it will be, uh, Kyrie will have a, a helix to it, you know? And depending on how you do that, each nanotube has very different properties depending on how you do that. And in fact, there is no method yet to really precisely make all the nanotubes have one helicity. 
So you end up making a mishmash of materials. Uh, you know, that's one of those, uh, file that away under an example of a long-standing problem. And uh, there's somebody, maybe hopefully in this audience, some of the young people who came up and asked questions, maybe one of them is gonna have a very clever idea, which in retrospect, everybody's gonna say, gosh, that was obvious, you know, when they figure out how to do it. So far, it's not been figured out. If you ever do, it's gonna have an enormous impact. Meanwhile, graphene is the story. How much of nanotech today is stamp collecting and how much of it would be used in everyday life? Uh huh. Okay. Uh, well, uh, how much is stamp collecting and how much is used in everyday life? Um, stamp collecting, I would say the nanoscience field uh, has uh, really gone through a lot of its stamp collecting phase. And it's in the phase now of having uh, a deeper understanding and developing uh, so that it can be more widespread in its use. Now, how much of it is in everyday life? Uh, it turns out uh, there are nanoscale explicitly controlled materials showing up in different contexts around us every day. Uh, but it's not so widespread that um, it's something that everybody immediately recognizes as touching them. So it's in between. It's sort of still a growing area, and, 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 and you know, so that, that's sort of my description of where it is. It seems that every technology is kind of a mixed bag of the wonderful and the unintended consequences. Yes. Do you have anything that worries you specifically now that 20 years from now we might look back and go, yeah, that wasn't maybe such a good idea? You know, you know look, I mean, I think the, the, there's an earlier question concerning the toxicology. And uh, I guess my concern there would be um, as we start now to learn how to ramp up the manufacturing of these things, uh, I would really like to see us have um, deeper understanding of the uh, potential toxicological impacts of each formulation and to have that really thought out more deeply. And uh, we've struggled a little bit because we have a kind of um, societal regulatory framework for ordinary materials. There are uh, material safety data sheets and all these things that you can look up and there's no, you know, things like that. And in the nanomaterials area, we struggle because as I mentioned earlier, you can have the exact same chemical composition of the interior material, but its formulation will alter how it gets uh, impacted inside the body. So to my mind, if there is an area that I'm most concerned about in this, it would be that, that you know, there could be a problem there where somebody would manufacture at scale and maybe the workers producing it might be exposed to materials that cause harmful effects. And so, uh, you know, I think as a society, we could do more there. Yes. Can you speak about the status of nantennas? Nantennas. No. <laughs> you got me there. I mean, uh, I, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> yes. I think you mentioned you have a separate talk about using nanotechnology for solar and renewable energy. I was wondering if you could give us a preview or a synopsis of the ideas that you share in that other talk. Actually, no, the, I mean, I do have a talk on that topic, but, I, but the talk I mentioned actually relates to, um, you know, um, I have a talk that is for a general audience related to uh, trying to understand the, um, the carbon cycle. What is the carbon cycle and how is it being perturbed? And what are the technologies, the various technologies that uh, might emerge that could uh, help, uh, you know, deal with it? And, um, you know, qualitatively what I would say is uh, we do know that uh, these are just the, the, the facts as I see them from my studies. We do know that uh, uh, carbon dioxide itself plays a key role in uh, uh, influencing the, the, the temperature of the planet and that uh, human-made emissions are, are really uh, uh, increasing in the atmosphere, changing the radiative balance, warming the planet, 
And uh, there are a lot of unknown consequences from what could happen as a result of that. But there are a lot of technologies, some existing and some developing, which would allow us to have, uh, to bring that under control so that we could have uh, a good population growth around the planet and so that the people who are very poor today, who live, uh, two billion people live under $2 a day, now uh, those people all really want to have a good life. It's possible for us to imagine a scenario where those people all have access to energy in a reasonable way so that they can have a, a good living, and yet we keep the carbon cycle in balance. So my view is that's very possible for us to do from a technical point of view. Of course, whether we do it as a society is another question we have to figure out. You know? Are you familiar with the technology of quantum dot solar cells that can be painted uh, or on surfaces? Yes. What are the main obstacles to bringing that to market? Are you familiar with that? And the second part of the question, if the obstacles for that are uh, too huge, what is uh, technology for solar energy that can be brought to market in the near future that you'd be banking on? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, let me say about quantum dot solar cells, there's a really, I'm enjoying that field, I work in that area myself, it's a wonderful area. Um, let me say this, that normally uh, if you uh, think about a solar cell, the way people developed them originally, and the first solar cell is almost 60 years old now, so really well understood, you try to have a very, very perfect crystal that's large, you absorb light in it, and the charges are drift and are collected. And so the, the, the behemoth uh, technology that has really always been the, the, the first and the strongest one has been crystalline silicon solar cell. That's what, you know, people make solar cells out of. And partly to answer your second question, I would say we're in this era now, very uh, interesting era, where the price of the silicon solar cells has dropped and dropped and dropped particularly as the Chinese manufacturing has kicked in and the prices have come down very, 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 very dramatically, which has changed the equation for all the other uh, potential technologies. Now, if you remember from my talk, when you try to grow a really big crystal, it takes a lot of effort to make it perfect. The bigger the crystal, the more effort you have to put in to make it be of very high quality. For that reason, for decades now, people have been trying to make thin film solar cells where they would just grow a very tiny film and very thin and grow the crystals on the fly really quick. And uh, then they could lower the cost of production. An example would be what First Solar does in the Cat Telluride solar cell. Beautiful things that they've been able to accomplish. It's a public company that's capitalized quite highly and has a really great product. If you look at them, and this is to answer your quantum dot question, if you look at a thin film solar cell like that, the goal is to make as perfect a crystal as you can between the two um, electrodes on the fly as a ribbon is flying by, if ideally, you would be making a thin film on it. And it's hard to make a perfect crystal, and so that's what the thin film industry really puts effort into. Then here come the quantum dot folks, and they say, hmm, what about if we just, instead of making a really big crystal, we replaced it with lots of teeny tiny ones, little quantum dots. And if you went and talked to somebody from the thin film solar cell industry, the first thing they would say is that, please have a seat, we'll get someone to come and examine your head, because uh, everything teaches us we'd like as perfect a crystal as we can have between here and there, and why would we break it up into lots of little pieces? Then the charges have to hop from one crystal to the next. It makes no sense. But it does turn out that um, in the limit of extreme quantum confinement, the very small crystal, uh, the electron that is photogenerated in the hole, as quantum objects, would really like to be spread out over many crystals. And so they can tunnel from one crystal to the next. So the charges can move from one crystal to the next by a different mechanism. It's a different physics than what's there in a conventional thin film solar cell. And the quantum dot solar cell has gone from not having existed to uh, grown up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, to where today you might make a solar cell with five or six percent power efficiency. Now that's compared to a 
a decent uh, solar cell, uh, silicon one that might be in the low 20s. So uh, it's not efficient today enough to be a commercially viable product. It's a good research topic. It's being studied extensively in the universities and the national labs, how to have these quantum effects show up. Of course, if that worked, then you could have the processing of a tiny crystal so you could potentially have some lower cost because you're not trying to make a very perfect crystal which costs you more energy and more processing time. So that would be a goal, but it's far off. And if you're asking me to bet on today's technologies, let me just say this, that in the solar field, there have been a lot of new bets, wonderful ones, different ideas for how to you know, make new generation of solar cells but the industry itself is in a lot of um, discombobulation because the uh, existing technology improved enormously in a very short period of time, more than anyone had anticipated. And so it's sort of um, uh, sucking some of the oxygen out of the room right now for the nascent technologies. I don't know how that's gonna play out over time, but that's the picture of what's happening at this moment in that field. Can I, can I ask you just one question? So, <clears throat> This is real speculation. Where, what is, uh, so plants are what, one or two percent efficient? One percent, okay. Max. And, and, and we can buy uh, solar panels now, they're doing 10 percent, and in the laboratory we have ones that are doing 20. Oh, in the laboratory you can have one that's um, 40 percent. 40 percent. But uh, you can buy ones uh, at the store if you're willing to spend just a little extra that are sort of low 20s. The 20s. Yeah. So, so in, let's say, let's just, I want you to look out like yeah. well, 10, 20 years and say, is it, you know, and of course, it's, can you manufacture it that's at a reasonable price? So, I mean, what if we could have solar cells on our houses or whatever it is at 20 or 30 or 40 percent, I mean, this changes the world, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. at a reasonable cost. Yeah, look, I mean, the issue with solar as it is now, the, t the technology, first of all, uh, what you said is correct, and the costs are coming down, and it's very close to hitting uh, grid parity with, with, with some of the uh, existing technologies. It depends on what market you compare it to. In some places, there are parts of the world where solar is already at grid parity, and there are parts For oil, depending against oil and so forth. Yeah. yeah, and there are other parts where it's not because the price that you pay in different parts of the world differs so much. But it's really coming down very quickly, and you know where those curves are going to cross. It's sometime in this decade there'll be a crossing point, and that's going to be a very important point. And 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 you know that looks like it's going to happen. Um, so that's the good news front. Uh, the bad news front is that solar suffers from the problem that we don't know how to store the energy. And uh, we ultimately need, you know, need to be able to have the, the ability to store the energy. That's, of course, what nature does. It takes the energy of the photon and it stores it in chemical bonds. And so that's how nature chooses to do it. So we could construct a system that would consist of solar cells coupled to gigantic batteries. The problem is that a typical battery has um, very low um, uh, energy uh, volume efficiency. You know, the batteries don't store a lot of energy in the volume that they have at all. So you'd have to have these enormous volumes. And that's why people are wanting to investigate this idea of artificial photosynthesis, which could even be as simple a thing as having a regular photovoltaic and then an electrolyzer that breaks water apart and collects hydrogen. Right. And you can take the hydrogen and use it to do different kinds of chemical transformations. So there are ideas like that out there, but I would say, look, I mean, from the short-term perspective, eventually there will be this grid parity and solar will take off and become a, a fraction of the energy supply. And what will limit it is not the supply of photons, but the problems that take place when you have no way to store the energy and you don't, you know, we want to be able to use the energy when we want it, not necessarily when the sun is shining. So, so, so that's going to limit it at some point. And, and there are different approaches then to how to solve that energy storage problem that will emerge over time. Yeah, I had one last question. So <clears throat> when I was growing up, there, there was a movie with was Dustin Hoffman and they said uh, plastics. That was a future. Plastics, yes. Uh, and so, and, and what right. I'm hearing people say now is uh, graphene. Graphene? Graphene, yeah. graphene batteries. How about graphene batteries? It's good stuff. Uh, I don't know that it's going to rank as plastics. Uh, plastics are a pretty big deal. 
but graphene's good. And of course, uh, you know, I do well, think that nano, of... nanomaterials more broadly can be uh, a class of material that, that, that will be as important as plastics because you can imagine them appearing in essentially almost anything that we do. Uh, you know, graphene is certainly great stuff. Is but Lawrence Berkeley Lab you know, working on the graphene? Oh, sure. like, oh okay. all over the place, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a, I mean, I, I think any, their battery is any major there. research place you go, they're going to be people playing their with Their batteries graphene. are like layers of like metals and so forth. And so what I heard is like, I can make now with graphene batteries, I make them, the density is, is orders of magnitude greater than any kind of battery material that we've been able to put together now. So I'm going to have a battery in my car, which is going to charge in 15 minutes and it's going to go, uh, you know, a thousand miles. Don't buy stock this week, okay? <laughs> it's, it's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> but it's an interesting proposal. <laughs> okay, well, let's say thank you. Thank you.